Hey, so today I've got a great case study video with you here. Uh, I've got my good friend, Victor, and uh, we're gonna be chatting about cold calling, which is kind of odd because I have said that uh, I don't think you should be doing cold calling or don't think you should be doing postcards because all of that is dead and you should be focusing on Facebook ads, but that is not 100% the case, and that's why we're having a conversation with uh, Victor uh, and I. And uh, Victor Jurasek, is that right? That's Close enough, I'll take yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, so Victor has a uh, unique name. Where, where's that name from, Victor? My family is from Slovakia, so Eastern Slovakia. Europe. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, pronounced Eurocheck, so the J is silent. Well, I'm a, I will tell you that you are, uh, you are my, uh, my favorite uh, Slovakian uh, <laughs> who lives in Florida and is a real estate investor. No one else has that position, okay? <laughs> well, I appreciate it, and I... I appreciate that I could be uh, interviewed on your show here. Yeah, and can, uh, get to get to see and get to know and understand what's working here for cold calling. Yeah. And just so you guys, so so you know, um, I, uh, Victor, and I, uh, let's go back to the story of how how kind of we got started. You, um, I'm trying to think about what, at what point was it specifically that we got connected? It was because sure, yeah. There was, uh, we have a mutual friend. Um, at that point, I was kind of ending a, ending a job up in Chicago and I was wrapping it up. I decided it essentially wasn't for me. It was a full-time job and I really didn't like it. So I essentially quit. And as I was wrapping up and trying to figure out my next moves, uh, I reached out to a mutual friend of ours and uh, he recommended that I get in touch with you, with get in touch with Chico. Right. Uh, yeah. I'd, uh, done real estate investing in the past and wanted to get back into it uh, but my experience really was limited it's uh it was extremely limited in terms of what i've done but got in touch with chico and then we just basically hit it off and it just made a lot of sense to to work together and chico's a great resource to say the least so i wanted to learn as much as i can i i wasn't worried about getting paid i was just worried about learning so that's what my uh, my biggest takeaway i want to kind of chat about how we worked together initially at the time, I was looking at implementing cold calling. I wasn't doing any cold calling at all. And so I was looking to bring that into, because everybody is you know, yelling, hey, everybody's doing cold calling. So I was like, you know what, let's give this a shot. Because I've always been the postcard guy. So, um, so then that's how really you and I got started working on cold calling. So we started, uh, you and I working together in, in the Miami-Dade area. That's where we started initially. I started basically from scratch. So I went in and I, we got a variety of different lists. We actually tested and to see which skip tracing services gave us the best output, et cetera. And then we then got going with the skip tracing and calling people. So we, we were talking on a daily basis and working through the lead. So the couple of things I'm going to talk about is I want to talk about what we experienced in here in Miami, in Dade County because of the fact that at some point, we really weren't getting any results. We were just kind of not getting anywhere. And there was a shift uh, that occurred in terms of the market. And then uh, I find that very interesting and I think it would be insightful for everyone there. And also too, I wanna to maybe chat about, uh, cause I'm curious, this is a question that I have, is that in the way that we were working together, uh, we work very intimately together every day on the phone, critiquing and trying to get better. And I wanted to find out from your perspective, um, what was it about that way of working that helped the most? And maybe, maybe what, what could have been better? Because I think that um, I'm, I'm always a, a looking for, hey, how can, if I'm doing any trainings or materials, um, how can I get better at teaching others and trying to get people ahead and trying to get them results? Um, and I think that we had some, uh, some setbacks with what we were doing initially, and then we were able to kind of turn it around, and now you're, you're successfully doing deals. Is that accurate in a, in a way, everything I just described? That's accurate. So I'll, I'll talk to it you know, start to finish. And we were, we were working on Miami. I was at the time just learning and getting the ropes of cold calling. And you have a lot of good scripts, uh, but it's one thing to, to practice the script cold by yourself. It's another thing when you have another person on the line and they're either busy or they have something going on, or sometimes they are interested in hearing what you have to say. So we were getting ramped up for Miami. And I know that you did cold calling previously in Miami. Uh, it might have been a year, maybe two before that. Right. And it seemed to be working then. What was interesting is we went into it and we tried a lot of things, a lot of lists. We went uh, tax delinquent, we went vacant, we did deed list. 
we went all over the place. And what we found and what I found was that it was extremely competitive. So I talked to folks and they'd pick up and I talked to them, hey, uh, calling about this property, uh, any chance you're considering selling? And they'd say, well, no, I appreciate the phone call. You're the third call I've gotten today. Mm -hmm. And I was calling maybe 8 a.m., 9 a.m. So yeah. I, I can't imagine how much volume they're getting. And trying to be competitive in that arena, in that market, was just very, very difficult. So we were <clears throat> getting leads, but it was hard to suss out any sort of real deal just because they're getting so much competition. And a lot of that was just inflated demand. So all wholesalers, for the most part, are going to price the deals the same, but the seller on the other side doesn't necessarily know that. They mm -hmm. get several calls a day, and they figure, oh, wow, this is great. This demand, this property has great demand. If I were to sell it, I'd get top dollar just because of all the people calling. But they don't realize that everyone is, for the most part, going to come in at the same price because uh, they have to sell it out and you know, people right. take it to return so on and so forth. So what we found, we were uh, doing quite a bit in Miami. We were there a couple months. We were getting leads, but uh, we just weren't able to close any. Um, it's such, you were such spending, a hot market. You were spending quite a bit of time on the phone. So on average, you were spending at least three hours a day on the phone calling, sometimes a little more than that. That's right? right, yeah. I was doing at least a good 12 hours a week cold calling, and we, were get, we almost got nothing, you know? And it, uh, now, it's during interesting. That time, during that, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. You say what you're gonna say, it's interesting. It was interesting um, how, how quickly it happened, how quickly it got competitive. Um, so I know you were getting deals previously is what you told me a year or two before. Right. And within, you know, months, a year, it shifted completely where a lot of people were cold calling and hitting the same people. And it was almost impossible to, to get a deal together. Yeah. And I remember the, the one thing that I remember from, from us working together is that uh, I always remember when you told me, when you said to me, oh, I'm getting people that said that they've already gotten a call today or this week right, uh, about their property. And all of a sudden, that made me start to think about like, okay, then how do we, how do we, how do we fight against that, right? Because now it's just, it's a, it's like a mad rush for the TV. It's a 60, it's a mad rush for the 60 inch screen TV at Walmart. There's only one and there's like a gazillion people try to get that, right? Then at that point, and then, you know, how can you, uh, uh, and now, now at, during that time, uh, just to give context, also, we were working on, uh, on, 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 on you getting better on the phone. So it wasn't where, you know, I think at the end when we finally decided, hey, you know what, I don't think this market is working. Uh, I think you had gone from, you know, from here to uh, substantially getting better on the phone. And I remember, I want to, before we get into like kind of what we did uh, in order to, to kind of have you get better success, I know that when we were on the, we, we had a lot of back and forth where, um, and I think sometimes I was a little bit rough around the edges where we were discussing, uh, you know, just you getting better on the phone, et cetera. Do you remember, do you remember those conversations or what we covered on those? I do. Yeah. So that was actually really helpful. Uh, I essentially went from zero to a hundred in terms of phone skills. I'm still getting better. Um, there's still lots of room for improvement, but there was a lot that was valuable. Um, it was, it was very helpful to go over specific calls because we actually recorded most, if not all of the phone calls I'd have with sellers. So right. not only the, the first prospecting portion of, do you want to sell your home? Not only that, but we also did the, the negotiation portion of it. So, you know, what's a, uh, what's a good price or would you take this number? So on and so forth, filling, you know, following that script. And although it was uncomfortable in the moment, you know, if someone, as someone's criticizing you, Hey, do this better, do this better. Um, it's uncomfortable to say the least, but in the long term, it's it's fantastic because you don't know what you don't know, and hearing yourself on a recording and having someone else point out your mistakes, it's it's super valuable because you don't know what what you're doing. For example, I was uh, I was making the mistake of just coming across as low energy. Yeah, so I would I would come across as low energy. That's how I usually talk, and that's fine. It's different one-on-one -on -one in person you can get hand gestures you have body language so you have a better sense of the energy level but over the phone a lot of that dissipates you just have their voice the volume pitch tonality all that stuff and i was just coming in low energy so i wasn't getting as much traction in terms of cold calling as i usually would and we worked on that and um, essentially the fix there was just for me to be over the top in my mind yes in terms of energy so i'd come in really high energy 
and uh, that really fixed it. We started getting more leads. We started getting more uh, prospects. We started doing better. Um, so that's that's why I recommend uh, if you could have someone, especially someone experienced, uh, critique you on your phone calls. And you don't have to do every one, but you know, mm -hmm. once in a while, critique you, uh, just so you know what's working, what's not, in terms of negotiation, and everything. And I remember the couple of things we talked about was cadence. Um, meaning that you have a particular dialect that we all do, right? We have a particular way of, of speaking. We don't notice it. And like, I remember one time I went to, um, I went to Tennessee, the first time I ever went to Tennessee and, uh, some guy looks at me and says, where are you from, man? You've got an accent. And I'm like, what do you mean I have an accent? I don't have an accent. And he's like, yeah, you do. Right. Because I'm from Miami. Right. And so I, I speak the way I speak and everybody speaks the way here, but when you go somewhere else. So you, have a, you had a particular cadence. I remember the way that you were speaking initially was like you had this up and down, like, hey, this is Victor. Like, remember that? Yeah, and, I do. Yeah. And, every, and that's just your natural way. And so that's one of the things that we worked on is that whenever somebody, when you're on the phone, the phone is an analog device. And, and the same way with video. When I'm recording a video for my YouTube channel, my energy has to be double or triple what it is normally, because otherwise then I'm going to come off, you know, I'm not going to come off, uh, come across the same way. And so that's one of the things we talked about is, um, is the fact that your energy level was too low. And so you had to run and, and for you, it was difficult because that was just your, you know, and, it, and it's nothing wrong with the way Victor is. It's just that for him to, you know, you got to think about somebody's busy. They're on the phone. You're giving them a call. They have no idea who you are. You've got a small amount of time to grab their attention and for them to think, okay, maybe I should listen to what this person has to say. Unfortunately, within that short period of time that you have available in that initial part of the conversation, you don't have enough time to say enough words to get them to be interested. Yeah. The only thing that you can do is you can get them interested with your tonality, with your inflection, with your enthusiasm. So all of a sudden now they, they're, they're like, okay, maybe this is someone different than the, you know, cause you have to think about the, what are they getting calls from? I get calls from people in India and in the Philippines telling me about my, my IRS uh, arrest warrant that's going to be issued. Right. <laughs> um, and I say that joke, you know, I don't have an arrest warrant, but I'm just saying that you get the robo calls. Right. But, um, but in the end, uh, that's what you're fighting against. And so you have to grab their attention. So that's one of the things we talked, we, we worked through is the cadence, um, and the enthusiasm on the call. And I, I know that, uh, when Victor and I work together, uh, I'm a big fan of Jordan Belfort. So that was kind of like the cadence and the whole, everything we worked through was around the Jordan Belfort straight line system. I'm curious, do you still follow that or is it still, maybe you've tweaked it a little bit and just for everybody's sake, before you answer that. It, with Jordan Belfort, his whole thing is that when you get on the phone, you got like three or four seconds that they have to, they have to think to themselves when you're on the phone with them that, that you are sharp as a tack, you're enthusiastic, and you're a figure of authority. Like those are the three things. You have to accomplish those in the first three to four seconds of the conversation. And all that is done with tonality. And so then he has a particular way of doing that where he comes across a particular way, particular script in order to get that person, you know, get that conversation moving. I was wondering if you still follow that or maybe you've changed it a bit. For the most part, I still follow all your same scripts. And I've, I've noticed myself whenever I fall off the script, I get worse results versus just following it and uh, just using that same language and sort of thing. The, the thing I remember most, especially part of the Jordan Belfort system, is uh, how to negotiate. So he talks about, I think it was looping backwards. Looping back, right. And right. Uh, like uh, Chico always talked about keeping your powder dry. So as you're trying to negotiate that price down and use that cash hammer to knock that price down, you are just bringing up other issues or bringing up new things that, um, that the, that's a benefit or that's something uh, of note to the seller. So, you know, first loop can be, you know, keep in mind, this is a net, this is what you'll put in your pocket. This is, you know, we can close in less than 30 days. Um, this, that, and the other should listen to the benefits. And then they'll, they'll talk. And then you can loop back again saying, you know, this, this property isn't in the best condition. It's a little bit outdated. You know, the roof needs to be uh, repaired, so on and so forth. Then you just keep looping back. Right. And it, if you don't do that, you'll just sound repetitive. So it just keeps on saying the same thing. Oh, we can close in 30 days. We can close in 30 days. And on, in their mind, on their side of things, they're thinking, well, I, I already know that. You already told me that. Um, what else do you have for me? Right. And it's, it's very powerful, that sort of negotiation tactic. I wasn't aware. Yeah, so just to clarify for, for, for you guys here, 
your sales, sales, the sales process doesn't really begin until you get that first no. So, you know, until you sell, until you give that offer and the, and the seller says no, that's really when the whole process begins. And you have a certain number of rebuttals, meaning that you can, you can and the rebuttals in our industry is, hey, I, I can buy cash as is. I can buy with the tenants there so you don't have to have them move out. I can buy it and let you stay at the property for a few months until you get your stuff out. So you have a certain number of rebuttals, and some of those rebuttals are uh, pertinent depending on that particular person's situation. So let's say that, as an example, that I have 10 rebuttals. Now, what we want to do what, when the concept of keeping the powder dry is that we don't want to throw all those 10 rebuttals out at the same time to the seller. Because if we take and we throw everything we can at the, everything that we can at the seller right at the very beginning, and then the seller says no, or we hit a standstill, then all of a sudden, we've got nothing else. Like we have basically took our revolver, uh, or, or whatever analogy we want to use, and we shot all of our bullets, and now we got nothing left. So we want to strategically understand the seller situation, but also at the same time, we want to be able to have rebuttals that we have to be able to go back and back and back and back. So in other words, I might say the first rebuttal might be like, you know, remember, Mr. Seller, we can buy the property as is. So that means that you don't have to make any repairs to the property. You can just leave it as is. Don't have to worry about a, a thing. That's one. So now if I have a back and forth with the seller and then now I have an, a second opportunity, now I'm, I'm, I'm then going to say, you know, remember, we can buy the property with the tenants there. So you don't have to worry about them moving out. But that's in a second rebuttal, not the same. And so the, the Jordan Belfort straight line says that, you know, as you're moving toward the sale, there's always a moving toward the sale and then a stepping back. Meaning that if I am moving toward the sale and I say, um, hey, uh, I can buy the property as is, then uh, that's a moving forward, right? I'm trying to move the sale forward. But if I get pushback from the seller, then what ha what's happening is I'm kind of moving back. But in order for me to move forward, I got to use another rebuttal or another uh, uh, something else that I can then continue to push the conversation forward. And that's why we want to keep our powder dry, meaning that at every instance, there's always that moving forward. We're always taking, it's almost like we're taking two steps forward with the seller, then taking a step back, then taking two steps forward again. And we're making that progress, but we can't make that progress if we take and we throw everything we can at the seller in terms of what we can do for them. And then all of a sudden now we've got nothing else to say. If for somebody that is doing a cold calling, what's that first three or four second spiel on the uh, on the cold call when you're first getting that person on the phone? Yeah, so this is the, the initial call. Um, so I use Mojo, so it'll pull up their name and the property address, and then I'll, I'll quickly click over to that Zillow. But I always do, and I don't know if this is exactly the word for word, but hey, this is Victor. Um, I'm actually calling about that uh, property on 10th Street. Is that yours? So that's the first right, okay. uh, first four seconds or so, and they say, "Oh yeah, um, it is," or you know, say wrong number or whatever, and then um, it goes into. Uh, I'm actually looking to buy some property in that area. Any chance you're considering selling? And uh, then they answer like, "Yes, I want to sell." No, I don't want to sell. Uh, but that's essentially it. I I really try to condense it on my end. Like you said, you only have that good four seconds of their attention, right. and if you hit it right in terms of pitch cadence. Uh, tempo, energy, then uh, you'll get a solid answer from them. The difference, and I remember, the difference is when you say, like right now when you said, hey, it's Victor, the most important thing I think that we worked on was the energy level, where, where you're coming across at a higher energy level, so that in that way, that helped you with the calls. Like people sometimes look at the script and say, well, what if I use this word, and what if I use that word? And yeah, those small words may help, but I think that if you were to focus on, uh, for everyone here, if you were to focus more on your energy, your cadence, and the way you come across tonality, yep. then that has an even, that has, that has the biggest impact. Because in, in communication, about 90% of communication is all, um, it, it's not the words you say, it's how you say the word, your tonality. And so I think that that's the biggest thing that I think um, I remember from us working together is we work every day on tonality. We did. We did. And I think the big thing that really helped me um, is what you mentioned in terms of mindset way back when and how you want to come across on the phone is essentially this is the only call I'm making today. And yeah. to this person, I, you know, you somehow you saw the house or you found out about the house and just to this specific person, it's your only phone call for the day. So with that mindset, you know, how are you going to come across? And for the most part, it's going to be, you're going to be relaxed, comfortable. Hey, how are you doing? A very personable. 
uh, and also energetic because you found this house, you know, you're excited to talk to them. But that's the, that's the mindset I always yeah. try to incorporate uh, in terms of doing my calls. Because if you're on the call, you know, yeah, you, you're calling for an hour or more uh, for a session, you're going to talk to, you know, 5, 10, 20 people. And yeah. uh, it can be hard to keep that energy up. But that's, that's the mindset. So I'm talking to somebody. I'm excited to talk to them. You got to work on those little things. But that, uh, that gets I do remember refined that. over I remember time. That. Um, just to clarify what Victor just said, you, it's easy to be on the dialer. And if you're on a dialer, you're making calls for an hour, two hours, you're, you're kind of getting to this routine where now every call just becomes monotonous. It's, it, it just becomes like a numbers game. And one of the things that I, we had discussed uh, when I, Victor and I were working together was the fact that you have to treat every call as if like that was your only call for the day and you were trying to get a hold of the seller. You've been trying to find them. And, and then finally, just finally, you got on the phone with them. You've, and then now you're so excited, like, oh my God, I can't believe it, John. I finally found you, finally got you on the phone. The energy level, I think that, and it's hard because if you're on the phones for two hours doing that, that's why you want to have breaks. But if you're on the phone for two hours pounding the phones, it's tough to keep that energy level. So, but you got to do whatever you can. It, it's almost like, uh, I'm not a sports guy, but you know, in a football game, you have how many plays? 30 plays. A receiver has to be ready a hundred percent for every single play because you never know when that ball is going to be the touchdown ball. You never know yeah. when that ball with that pass is the perfect scenario where the defense messes up and now you've got a chance to score a touchdown and you never know when that ball is going to come. And that's the thing. You never know when you're going to get on the phone with a seller and that seller is that one seller that now has a deal that you're going to put in the contract and now make your $30,000 or whatever that number is. And you don't want to screw that up. So every single, it's almost like every single down has to be played at 100%. And that's the way you have to approach it is every single time you get on the phone, you don't know if that deal is going to be the deal that makes the difference for you. And you have to be prepared for it. Um, and so I think that that's, uh, that's, that's what I would expand on what you were saying. And I do remember that because we definitely had lots of conversations about that. We did talk about it. I want to yeah. interject one thing uh, that I think would be super helpful for you and your, your viewers here. Um, part of that approach uh, of being personable, I've gotten deals where I, I called them and they picked up. And just because I was personable and friendly and I did it correctly, you know, hit it like I, I should have with your, uh, with your football example, uh, not necessarily that property they were looking to sell, but they had another property. <laughs> right. So I wasn't hard line A to Z. Oh, you don't want to sell. I hang up. I was a little more conversational and because of that, they said, Oh, I actually have another property that I'm looking to sell. And I've gotten, you know, I'd say two, maybe three deals that way um, at least. And, you know, working on closing them or have yeah. closed them for that reason. Um, so you need to have that better approach and you're going to have a lot more success. You'll just do a lot better and deals that you didn't think were deals are suddenly going to become deals right. just because you're doing things correctly. When they get on the phone with you, like they almost have to be like, man, this guy, he sounds, he sounds different than the other guys than the other bozos. I think yeah. this guy may know what he's doing. Hey honey, I think this guy might be the guy for to sell this, this damn house that we wanted to sell, but all these bozos <laughs> keep on calling me. Um, so, and also I want to mention this. I mean, if I think about the work that we did, right. And, and there's not, I, I, you know, I have, I have people that work overseas, but one of the mistakes I make is that people try and get this outsource to someone in the Philippines, as an example. And then they work, then they can't figure out, well, why am I making any deals? Because my $5 VA is, uh, is not, you know, you know, I have them calling all day. I have three of them calling and I can't seem to make it work. I think that does, that's part of the problem. I think if you're, if you're, if you have overseas, either a, you're not, either it's not working for you, or if it is working for you, then it's probably could work amazingly better for you if you had better people on the phone because uh, all the stuff that you and I went through, it's tough to get somebody trained overseas. And so, so I'll leave it with that. So we were at a point where basically I said, look, uh, this stuff, it, it, it's not working out here in, in, in Miami-Dade. We were calling, we've made thousands and thousands of calls and it just isn't, isn't working. And, uh, and so then, um, I don't know if it was you suggested or maybe I, I don't remember, but how did it come about that, that we, that it was like, Hey, why don't you do it in your, cause you, you live, you don't live in Miami. So just for everybody's sake, as he was making these calls, you were, he was not in Miami. He was not at, at, at uh, physically located anywhere near any of these properties. 
and you live in the northern part of the state, which is a much smaller, I think, what's your population size over there, 250? Right, so I moved from uh, Chicago to Gainesville, Florida. Right. So that's like Alachua County. It's 130,000 population, so it's a smaller town, smaller right. market. And um, I think it was your suggestion where it had been a few months and there, there were no deals that we had done for Miami and there were no deals in the pipeline. Right. right. So if you have a deal in the pipeline, oh, okay, it's under contract. We have some buyers looking at it. You can work with that, but we weren't anywhere near that. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> it, was, it was nothing. And um, yeah. uh, some of that, I can take some responsibility for that because I was learning, but I think part of it was the, was the market. And uh, we, we well, essentially... Proven, now, with, this, well, with the second part of the story, we've proven that, yeah, maybe it could have been you, but toward the end, you were, I mean... In the beginning, maybe, but as we progressed toward the end, you, I mean, you were, you were doing much better. You were like, well, you went from here to like here on the phone mm -hmm. and then, then you went to, so then you started making calls in Gainesville. So the couple, yep. so I want you to discuss that. I want you to also talk about the couple of things that I want to maybe bring up by the discussion is how did you find, number one is competition. Number two is how did you find speaking, you know, the, when you speak to somebody, we always had a conversation. Like I said, you know, Miami, everybody's a hustler. Nobody has a job. Everybody here hustles for money. So when you get a seller on the phone, like, I'm like, man, this is a town where they're like, if you're a ninja, you want to go fight like, you know, the first graders, right? At the local school in Miami, everybody's a ninja. The seller's a ninja, right? So, uh, so I want to see if we could talk about like, how do you find the sellers? Like you talking with them, what the difference in the sellers was and also the competition when it comes to like, you know, what you experienced in Miami, like give us an idea of the difference. Oh, absolutely. So, so I'm in Gainesville, Florida now. So it's like Northern, Northern Florida. That's about uh, kind of like North central Florida is what it's called. Smaller population city. Um, it was a huge difference between Miami. Uh, so first off in terms of wholesale competition, there's a lot less over here. There's a lot less over here. There's, uh, there's only one guy who I know who's full-time uh, here. And uh, right now he's also looking at going to Jacksonville. So he's going to be splitting his time between two markets. Right. So there's one full-time wholesaler who's getting consistent deals. There are other wholesalers, but they're wildly inconsistent. So maybe they do some driving for dollars, but it's part-time, maybe a couple hours a week. Maybe they suss out a couple deals a year, but nothing, nothing crazy. Right. And then they're all over the board. So they maybe get a mobile home deal one time and then maybe a, a town home another time and maybe a plot of land the other time. So not very consistent. So in terms of getting sellers uh, through cold calling, it, it was effective. I still have to do the work. I still have to make the calls, but I was getting much better results, much, much better results versus Miami. So I've done from, I'd say November till now, mm -hmm. which has been three, four months let's say including the end of this month, I'll have closed, I don't know, eight to 12 deals, eight to 12 houses. Uh -huh. so, uh, so pretty good pace, pretty good consistency and more in the pipeline. So that's, that's exciting. So the cold calling, that's all I've been doing. I've just been doing cold calling, just calling, calling, calling. Right. But I did find, however, wait, there's wait, a flip that, side. Wait, okay. Because I got distracted. My mother-in-law came in. Oh, is that right? So okay. He doesn't know the concept <laughs> of recording a video interview. So I had to flag her down and say, oh, this is not a good time. <laughs> We're not going to edit that funny. out. Okay. Uh, going to keep that in. Okay. Yeah. And then my wife. real interview. Yeah. For anybody who's, who, who, who's curious, who's that woman that sits behind you, Chico? That's my wife. So um, that's how we roll here. We just take out the interview and we just go with it, right? Um, so you done eight, eight, How many deals did you have, had you done already? Uh, so it's uh, eight to twelve houses. Um, so one of these deals we're closing at the end of March. Uh, she has five houses I see. that she's okay. looking to sell. Um, so yeah. it, the range is eight to twelve because one person has more than one. Is that where you kind of the, what what uh, what? Could you say that you've done eight to twelve houses? Um, so you've done a total of, is that eight sellers because then there's 12 houses? Oh, no, I, I was just giving like a, a rough range of what okay. I've done. Um, I was, I don't know the specific number, but it's, okay. it's somewhere in there. So how, how much would you say that since, uh, so you, you, you're down in Miami and you were drawing blanks and then all of a sudden now, what would you say, you know, rough, uh, that you've been able to now since November doing the cold calling again, your whole focus is on cold calling that you've been able to generate in, in profits from that. Um, yeah, so I, I do pretty good. Um, I guess my average per deal right now is about five to 10,000 in terms okay. of my profit. 
And um, the, the flip side to Gainesville, to the smaller market, is yes, it's easier to get sellers, but I'm also finding a lot more difficulty in getting good buyers. Right. So over in Miami, I remember it was, you know, you throw a deal up on Craigslist and you can get it sold pretty quick. And there's no worries about that. You know, can I find a seller? If it's priced right, you'll find a seller or find a buyer, excuse me, no problem. Gainesville's a little bit different. Uh, so I got into it and I found out pretty quick that people want home run slam dunk deals over here. Mm -hmm. So they don't want, they want, you know, 65 cents on the dollar property uh, minus repairs. So you're, you're buying right. these properties, you know, like, let's say half price. So you got to be more uh, aggressive with, uh, you got to get some really good deals over there versus yes. here in Miami, you can get marginal deals because everybody and their mother wants to grab onto a deal. So they're willing to take marginal deals. Whereas over there, that's what you're saying is that you really got to get some juice on the deal, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's the same sort of thing here where there's less full-time investors, less right. full-time flippers where they have a, you know, they're a lawyer, they have a, they're a doctor, they have some sort of full-time job and they do this on the side. Right. So there's less motivation there. So if they do a deal or two a year, they're happy versus a full-time person, you know, they got to keep their crews busy. They got to keep their people busy, uh, so on and so forth. And so it's a world of difference in terms of that as well. So it's easier to get sellers, but it's harder to get buyers. So it balances out. And, and um, so, so uh, a question I had about the sellers and also a question I had about the buyers. So in terms of the sellers, how do you find the demeanor of the sellers compared to a large market like, you're, like we're at in Miami? Like, are they like nicer to talk to? Are they like not ninjas? Or what would you say the sellers <laughs> are? They're school children. They're first graders, Chico. They're <laughs> That's first how we graders. like them. That's how we like them. Right. Okay. Um, but it, yeah, in all seriousness, they're a lot more open and amicable. Uh, right. as you, if you can imagine uh, getting, you know, let's say several phone calls a day about a property. Right. At a certain point, you're going to keep it pretty brief. You know, in five seconds, you'll say, hey, I don't want to sell and end it. Whereas here in Gainesville, I, I call them up. And sometimes they even thank me for calling and they said, Oh, well, I appreciate you reaching out, uh, but I don't want to sell right now. I see. So, so it's, a, it's a different demeanor. Friendlier, yeah. Yeah. A lot, a lot friendlier and whether or not they mean it, I, I can't speak to that. But the fact that they're saying that is, is a positive. And sometimes I just chat, chat with folks for a minute or two and uh, it's just a lot more friendly. It's a lot more friendly, uh, which, is, which is a lot more positive to say and, the least. And the list that you're targeting, uh, I know you're doing absentee. Are you also doing like the vacant or tax delinquent as well? I've, uh, uh, I did the absentee. I'm, uh, I've pulled tax delinquent. I'm working on that. I'm doing, I did vacant and that one worked pretty well. And then I'm doing out of state as well. Out of and state. So I'm, I'm hitting all these different lists. It's, uh, since it's a smaller market, there's less, there's less people, people to dial through. through. Right. Yeah. So there's about five, 55,000 houses in Gainesville. And, uh, I don't know, I'd say maybe 10%. Right are open to selling and then, you know, maybe it's 1% of that 55,000 are potentially deals. I don't need that much to, to get going. On the deals you're doing, are you, are you physically going to meet with the sellers or are you doing it uh, without that? I'm still, I'm still doing it over the phone. I'm still doing you're everything still doing over it. the phone. Okay. Uh, with the absentee owners, that made sense. Right. Um, I'll slowly more transition to doing it in person, uh, especially if it's on the cusp or if I can get it a little better right. in terms of a deal by showing up in person. Uh, that would be more valuable, but for now it's all over the phone. So you're and getting the you're getting the, well. the agreement signed over the phone using HelloSign, right? I use HelloSign. I use the electronic version. Okay. And for the most part, I'd say eighty percent of people are open to just the e-sign. Uh, I haven't had any issues there. And are you um are you at all going to the property after you put it on the contract, or no, not at all? It's it's a little more fluid in terms of my process. Uh, so sometimes the sellers want me to see the properties beforehand, right. so they know what I'm getting into. Sometimes I, I see the properties afterwards. For the most part, I've found that the sellers are relatively honest about the properties. Right. So it's, it's very rare that there are surprises in terms of the condition or the situation or you know the house or anything like that. And even if there are issues, we always go through an inspection period and we can always negotiate or give them a haircut. Like, Hey, we didn't know about this. There's a roof issue or there's this issue. And for the most part, they're, they're flexible since they're so far down the line. And then what about, um, in terms of the, uh, when, when you are showing the property to a buyer, are you going to the property with the buyer 
or no, the buyer just goes on their own and then you just square it away, make sure they don't say anything to the seller, et cetera. I, I do with the buyer. I do with the buyer. Uh, okay. I don't trust the buyers enough because okay. they might say, you know, one, one small thing wrong. Right. And um, it just can mess up the entire thing. It's a very, you know, tricky situation in terms of how I've presented myself and so on and so forth. And it's worked out where I didn't use your methodology in saying, um, saying these are funding partners. Mm -hmm. And I think I said that I was an investor myself. And for that deal, I was going to wholesale it. And then she found out and wasn't happy with it. She, she, she said, you know, oh, you're one of those house flippers where you just put it on right. a contract and sell it without any money into it. You're not a real investor. So that deal fell through. Oh, that's interesting. Um, okay. So yeah. just to go back to on that one there, you told the seller that you were looking to, to wholesale it. Is that you said that to her or no? What was it? No, I said, I said I was an investor looking to buy it. Uh -huh. And I brought a couple people there. I think I had maybe two showings to see the I place. See. Yeah. And uh, she kind of caught wind of it and it just, it just fell apart from there. Yeah. Where I presented myself as an investor. I didn't explain the funding partner thing. Right. Uh, okay. I get it. So you weren't, you're, so uh, you know, it could have been that she could have been, uh, it, maybe that may not have made a difference in that particular, you know, seller, right? Because she would have maybe said the same thing, but yeah, the funding partner, because it makes sense. I would say that the funding partner makes better sense than say a property inspector, because in that way, very, very easy to argue that yep. hey, I need somebody else to bring me the money and I partner up with people on these deals and that's how I close them and everything else. And so I got to, you know, some, sometimes I don't like the deal. So I got to find somebody else that likes the deal once they give me the money. Uh, talking about the buyers, uh, you said it's a smaller, uh, smaller market. So what has worked with for you best in that in that smaller market to find buyers? To, to be honest, I'm uh, I'm starting to morph towards a more self-sustained model, a more a more independent model, where I I've, I'm partnered with a guy out of state who's providing like liquidity and um, he's providing like good credit. So we're doing a lot of these deals now and into the future. We're doing burr, so build or buy, renovate, rent, refinance. So I'm actually getting ownership in these uh, I see. Uh, houses. Okay. So I'm actually, you know, buying it for myself and renting it out. And it's less of a, a check up front. You know, it's not a $5,000, $10,000 check, but I'm actually owning the houses and getting, you know, a cut of the cash flow, uh, which I think is more exciting. So that's how I'm starting to work around it. And then that, and then just doing the flips myself. I, uh, I have a, a family member here in town who I work with, mm -hmm. um, who, who, you know, she, she likes to do the, the flips and we know our numbers. So we know what we're going to get the property for. We know what the repairs are and we know just roughly what it's going to sell for. So what our profit's going to be. And it just doesn't make sense to me to try to negotiate with the buyer when I know the right. numbers, like I know what everything is going to cost. I know what flooring costs. I know what roofs cost. You're closing, so why are you trying to, you're closing yeah. rehabbing and then, and then reselling the ones that you're not going to keep. You're reselling those, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, uh, I'm pushing, farther away from the wholesaling and doing my own deals um, just because the, the buyers here are just looking for home runs. And I've gotten uh, the same comment and feedback from other, other wholesalers, especially just the one here where they want, you know, really, really good deals. And I'd rather do the deal myself and get that benefit right. than try to sell it off for someone and then just get, you know, lowballed in terms of the, the buyer's offer. on the And the ones that you did wholesale, uh, did yeah. those come because you partnered with a wholesaler and you, oh, you, did you get the buyer yourself or how did those work out? The ones that you did, you did wholesale versus keeping or rehabbing? The ones I did wholesale myself were for the most part JV. So I just joint venture with someone and it's just 50-50. Right. Yeah. I remember that that's when you were first starting out anyway. So you didn't have a buyer's yeah. list, et cetera. Right. Okay. Exactly. It, exactly. So, so, I mean, right now though, I mean, it's, in terms of your, your principal strategy, it definitely is a cold calling. You're continuing to do that now, right? Yes. Okay. And then, uh, so there's, now I know that I think we're going to have to have a second interview. Okay. And this second interview is going to be on Facebook because you're just starting the Facebook ads now. You're trying to get that up and running and trying to work that, right? Yes. Okay. So I want to talk about that because in the beginning, we started with a cold calling, but we talked about uh, right before we get on the call that I wanted to chat about was that you know, every strategy works, but not every strategy works in every market and not every strategy is for every investor. So the benefit that you have with a, with a cold calling, I think in general, right, when all said and done, you're going to be able to produce leads with minimal cost because all it is, is you on the phone calling these sellers. Now we talked about the fact that um, if you had a full-time job, if you were working full-time nine to five, it would be tough for you to cold call because you don't have the hours in the day. So you 
have the flexibility that you know you're you're you uh, you left your your position and you took a leap of faith but you have the whole, you know you're cold calling dur- during the course of the day right so you're cold calling yeah. what nine nine in the morning to like what, what's your schedule like with cold calling i do i do 30 minutes in the morning it's uh-huh. usually eight eight to nine roughly in that time time frame right and then i do an hour and a half in the evening which is usually three to five three to six just in that rough time block um, let's say I start at three thirty and go to five, so I do a full one hour, hour and a half. Well, that's interesting. So you don't do any any more than thirty minutes in the morning, right? Because before, when you and I were doing it, you were doing like two or three hours in the morning. I was doing a lot more in the morning previously. Yeah. So um, why, why the change? I I found I was pretty inconsistent. So like one week I do really good, and the next week I, week I'd fall off in terms of my cold calling hours. Cause I'm just looking oh, at the hours I put yeah, in yeah. and I was really wildly inconsistent. So I figured what if I set a slightly lower baseline or slightly lower quota and I just yeah. hit it every time. And then I get that psychological boost versus like, Oh, I, I didn't do it this week. Oh, I did it this week. So I just hit it. I'm just doing 10 hours a week total. Right. 10 right. hours a week. Good cold calling, um, keeping that energy up. And yeah, that I hear what seems to be working. That, as opposed to doing like, setting a goal for three or four hours a day, which is a, a very lofty goal. And then all of a sudden you don't meet it. And then you feel bad because you didn't meet the goal. And then you feel like, Oh man, now next week I gotta, so I, I hear what you're saying on that. Um, yeah. And in terms of, you know, I mean, all things being equal, I would say you tell me, but I think that moving to that new, moving to a different market made the difference for you because everything else stayed oh, yeah. the same, right? It did. Um, so the, it, I think the change in market really helped. I think, being local helped. It's not everything to be local. Right. If I need to see a property, cause I'm still closing it over the phone. It's just helped. It, you know, gave me like a 10% boost in terms of performance, right. not much, but noticeable. Um, so it really did make a difference. And, uh, that was, that was promising to say the least. Uh, it can be disheartening to go into that huge market like Miami and not get anything. Right. And then you know, turning to Gainesville and figuring, okay, well, this is starting to work. Something's working here. There's a, there's a difference here. And I think it's also, um, you know, the, the fact is, is that there's, there's a bit, there's quite a bit of people in Miami cold calling. So when it comes yep. to hours cold calling, you know, it might take someone 60, 70 hours of cold calling in order to get a deal. And granted in Miami, you find a deal, it's a good deal. You make a lot of money from it. Uh, but you know, those are nuances that are specific to the market. Uh, so nothing bad against cold calling, but I think that the, the thing I think about is knowing um, I, I was thinking about this the other day is, 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 is a lot of times people get involved with things in our business, not knowing they're, they're looking for water, but they don't realize how deep the well has to be dug. And by that, I mean that if you are looking to do uh, direct mail, as an example, and you say to me, not you, Victor, but just, you know, you guys in general, if you're looking to do direct mail, you say, Hey, um, I'm looking to do direct mail and I've got a $500 a month budget to spend on direct mail that's going to be a tough thing for you to get any traction because direct mail is going to demand that you go out and you send more mail. Now, obviously that, that varies depending on the market, but if you're in a market like Miami, unless you're willing to put out 2,500 to 3,000 pieces a week in direct mail in order to get something going, you're just wasting your money. You might as well do cold calling, might as well do something else. So knowing, you know, it's, it's, it, it's not cookie cutter because every strategy is a combination of, of a couple of things. Number one is what you like to do, right? Your available resources, both in time and money, um, and the market. And those are three things that kind of have to come well, come together correctly um, in order to, to, to be the, fa- the, the right strategy. And that's all something, something that you can sustain because, you know, if, if you can only mail 500 pieces this month, but next month you don't know, then you might as well not even do direct mail because you're never going to get anywhere with it. Versus if you know that you can at least make calls for an hour a day, you can do that consistently over a month, over two months, then that is a better strategy for you to implement. So right now you, you just started with the Facebook ads, all things being, all things being equal, you know, the Facebook ads, you know, even if you, uh, if you had to start from scratch, I think you would still, you correct me if I'm wrong, you would still do the cold calling because that was the most economical and the best way to get going. And it also too, you needed some uh, phone work. So that helped in getting better on the phone. Is that accurate? That's exactly right. So if I were to start again, I do the, the cold calling again. Uh, first off, it's a really low cost per lead. So right. right now with me doing it, I don't know, I'm maybe in the five, $10 a lead range, which right. is, which is great. I'm happy with that. 
And so that's fantastic. And the other thing is just practice. So you got to get the bugs worked out um, early and that's just going to take time. That's going to take a number of phone calls uh, versus getting those Facebook leads in or direct mail leads in and you don't know what to do. You don't know how to handle it. Right. You don't know if they come up with a specific objection. What do I say? So the, the cold calling is a great way to get started. I'd, I'd even recommend, you know, even if people don't want to do cold calling long term, just try it for a week or two just to get the bugs out and get some training in. To get better, to get better on the phone. And just get better at it. Yeah, just get better at the phone um, or just get better in dealing with sellers and everything. Uh, because yeah. even if you do this stuff in person or over the phone, whichever, you still have to practice and you get the get the confidence up in terms of dealing and handling uh, the things as they come up. And if you really want a good, like, if you really want to, like, jump right into the fire, just grab a bunch of numbers from Miami and call those sellers and they'll run you ragged. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> uh, so we're going to have to, uh, so you're just starting Facebook. So maybe uh, we will have to have another second interview, you and I. Right. Um, uh, once you get your first deal under, under your belt, uh, using Facebook ads and, uh, and, 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 and again, guys, look, every strategy works for everybody. It just depends on what you want to do. I've always been a put money in the cash register and have sellers call. I tried cold calling. I didn't like it. I tried another technique called door driving. I told you about that one, right, Victor? Door driving. The driving for dollars. One? No, door driving. Door driving. I haven't yeah. heard that one. It, it Knock does. on the doors? Well, you know, it, it's a very, very horrible strategy. I don't recommend anybody using it because it works horribly, horribly in any market. That doesn't strategy. Door driving is when you go out with the intention of knocking on doors. Back in my days, a lot of pre foreclosures are getting mail, so people said, go knock on a door. So do door driving is when you get a list of properties, right? And you go ahead and you get in your car to go ahead and, and, and stop at the house and knock on the door. But um, you're too chicken shit to stop. And so you just drive. You keep on driving. <laughs> <laughs> right. Jesus. Right. So, so that's door driving. So don't try that. But, you know, for me, I've always been a guy that I like. You know, I'm a systems guy. So I like, you know, putting together a system and paying for it. But yep. if you don't got the money or maybe the budget isn't there, then, you know, you got to look at other options. So, you know, what I'm saying is different strokes for different folks. You could do cold calling at the same time you're doing Facebook. It doesn't, you know, one is not exclusive over the other. But I think that, you know, picking something that you can be consistent with, that you can know that you're, you're going to like doing and that you can, um, that you can uh, sustain over a period of time in order to get results. I think that's the most important thing. And that's what I think you've done is you've said, hey, let me put the blinders on. Let me focus on this get my traction, which I think you have. Now you've got other options, which I think is now the next step. Now you got to do some, you have to do some, some deals on Facebook so I can bring you back. Yeah, okay? no, I'm, I'm into a second interview and the Facebook, cause I know, I know we're getting good leads. Uh, cause I talked to the people. So I know, I know there's potential there. I think it's just going to be a numbers game in terms of yeah. getting something closed. Uh, but I can hear it on, in their tone. And that's another good thing with cold calling where you get your experience up really quick. And I can hear, I'd say within the first 30 seconds of a conversation, maybe in 15 seconds, just based on the seller and how they react to me and a list of other things, whether or not it's a deal with yes. pretty good confidence, uh, just by doing it so much. You know, if you talk to someone, you, they, uh, you talk to them and they, they don't want to talk to you at all and they hang up ASAP, well, that's, that's not a deal. But right. if, they're, if they're talking to you and if they go through and explain their entire situation, mostly unprompted so you don't even ask them you say do you want to sell and they go through a two-minute speech oh it's tax delinquent i don't want to deal with it anymore this that and the other i'll take x for it then i mean you, you really learn quick in terms of what works and yeah. what doesn't yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. and so then now we just have to uh we have to bring you back with some facebook you know, <laughs> I don't know if you saw that, that uh uh brandon in, in the group posted he had a great deal that came in he made like 25k off of that deal on facebook um, and so the, saw you saw that, you saw that there yesterday, I think it was yesterday he posted. It was one of those. And it was something like, yeah, it was like twenty five, thirty thousand dollars check, which for most people, including myself, I mean, that's life changing. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, so, that, that, uh, that moves the needle. That moves, that moves the, needle. the needle. That moves the needle. In Miami, it barely pays the <laughs> and the, and the gas for the length of the evening. Right? It, still, it goes very, very far. You could buy the town. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't get uh, yeah after that yeah. deal after a deal like that I don't yeah. Gainesville yeah. which is pretty exciting 25k in Miami barely enough for a weekend getaway and a few <laughs> bottles of club and then that's it 
Yeah, and I'm, I'm talking about the nightclub, not that other kind of club. I don't, you know, I'm married and I have kids, so I don't go to those other CD clubs. Just for that's uh, just for, just for uh, I know. I remember marriage. you telling me about it. You uh, yeah. you read some books about that topic. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but listen, I appreciate our time together. Really appreciate you coming on. And and uh, what I'll do is in the description. Um, and if you're on, uh, if you have an Instagram or Facebook or whatever you have, just let me know, and I'll put that in the description. If folks are going to reach out to me, I'm happy to help in terms of advice and everything that like that. I mean, feel 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 free to reach out. I'm happy to help. Um, just stick to Facebook would be okay. ideal. Like I have Instagram and that sort of thing. I don't really check it though. Okay. So I'll if they could just hit me up on Facebook, yeah. uh, I'm happy to help. And you know, it takes 30 seconds on my end to answer a question, but for other folks, I mean, it, it can really change the change their business, even if it just puts them in the right so direction. I'll put the link to your Facebook profile. Uh, in the description. So if you guys Great. want to say hello and um, you know what, if you've, if you've gotten, if you got a lot of insight from this interview, post a comment here, let us know if you have any questions, let us know and uh, let Victor know that uh, the, uh, the time here that we spent together was helpful to you. And uh, again, I am then saying that we need to have a second interview and the next one has to be in person because you and I never met in person anyway. So that's true. That's right. another Right. Uh, neat little tidbit. We worked together hopefully, for months and months. As I always say, hopefully meeting in person will not ruin the relationship, <laughs> right? You mean like Chico, man, this guy, he's much better on video and on camera, but in person, oh my God, that guy is horrible. So hopefully you're not going to say that. I don't think so. But well, I, I hope not. You can always sway me back <laughs> yes. to being good friends. You just take yes. me to one of those clubs you uh, you've yeah, read about. Right. We'll, uh, we'll call it good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. So guys, everybody just uh, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. If you're not subscribed to it, give me a thumbs up. And if you have any questions, comments, or anything, Thing, put them in the comment section. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time to watch this video. And again, keep an eye out on additional trainings and videos we're going to have here on the channel. Thanks a lot.